part two, the compassion for healing. And this time, we're going to look at one single healing, one single incident. And this incident is in the pool of Bethesda. Now, you always look for the meaning of the names. And there is some difference of opinion, but if you go to the actual Aramaic of the day, it would be Beit Chesda, which means house of mercy. I, I, it's a transliteration into the Hebrew, really, of that name. So it means house of mercy, and that will become very important as we continue. The story is fantastic. It is fantastic. Jesus is on his own. He is just by himself. And this is on, uh, and I'm, I'm going to explain that. Let, let, let's have a look at the text. After this, now this word after this, you remember that chapter 4, because we're in chapter 5 now. Um, uh, chapter 4, of course, is the incident uh, of the woman there. You remember the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well? And remember Jesus saying, remember Jesus saying that it was still a few months before the harvest. Do you remember that incident? And he said, the fields are white of the harvest because remember the woman who had five husbands, yeah? The other women didn't like her. She was a husband snatcher. And she went back to the city and she came, she came with all the men folks after her. Remember that incident? They were all following her, this time for a different reason. And, and they were all going to meet Jesus, you understand? So, so and, and then Jesus says, look at the harvest, you know, the, the workers. You know, he's, he's, he's aware, we need the workers. And so it's a few months before the harvest, and that would be also the barley harvest. This feast here would be the Passover. And that's important. It's a Passover. So the Passover, it means that you, you have the Jews from everywhere. There were three feasts while they had to come to Jerusalem annually, and this was number one, if you like. The most, the Passover, that was the, the most important. So it is as the feast of the Jews, it will be the Passover and Jesus, and that is of course sort of end March, early April, our, our calendar date. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew. Now when they refer to Hebrew here, they often they refer to the Aramaic of the day, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now, when I was there in 1967, uh, they just had taken the old city. And they couldn't wait until they could start digging, because it was under the Jordanian jurisdiction, of course. They really had to fight for it, uh, but, but the Israelis got in and they controlled that part. And, and the, that, of course, the Temple Mount we're talking about. And so what happened is that I was aware of the fact that they found a location that they might identify as the pool of Bethesda. Um, and so uh, they did a lot of diggings at the time. The five porches, well, you've got to understand, Jerusalem has been destroyed a number of times. And so every time they build it up, it becomes higher and higher. Um, I'll show you a photo in a minute. Now, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, so that it was very busy. That little place is not huge. It was, it was very, very busy. They were waiting for the moving of the water. Now, I have to explain something. I haven't noted verse 4 of chapter 5, because probably verse 4 was inserted later on. It said that an angel would come down, would stir the water, and whoever got in first would be healed. You familiar with that? Well, it was put there by way of explanation. It may not have been there in the original gospel, but it doesn't matter. What is important is that the people that are congregated there are congregated there because they hope and pray that they will be healed by a phenomenon that the, that the water will be stirred up by the angel. And as I said, whoever got in first was supposed to be the one that was secured of a cure. Now, this is purely a tradition. It's not, what, it's not true. It just developed. Uh, like some of the, uh, the, the pilgrimages that people make today. I, I think of uh, Lourdes in, in the south of France. Roman Catholic Church has a number of places where you can make a pilgrimage and it's supposed to help you. There's a spa there at Lourdes. 
It's a big money spinner. You want to see the money they make. Um, uh, but anyway, here the people, it was not so much the money, it was the belief, the traditional belief that that pool there was stirred up. It was really an artesian uh, water supply that could, uh, what shall I say, disturb the surface of that pool. It could make it rise. If you have an understanding of the topography there of Jerusalem, sometimes the mountains, the water, uh, the, the table of water under the ground could make it rise. And that would then perhaps be deceived as the action of an angel, where it's purely a natural thing. Now, so there was a certain man... You want, to, you want to see this clearly. Who had an infirmity 38 years. It doesn't say that he was there at the pool of Bethesda for eight, uh, 38 years. Do you understand? It says that he had an infirmity for 38 years. Do you understand? He'd probably been there a significant time, but we don't know how long. 38 years is a long time to be in a condition where you pretty well, not quite paralyzed maybe, but completely enfeebled, not capable of moving properly and looking after your own needs and being dependent on the handouts of those who might have compassion on you. Now Jesus walks in there and he sees him lying there. And he knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He had never seen him before, but the Spirit clearly made it clear to him. Now, here is an interesting statement that I get from Desire of Ages. Jesus was again at Jerusalem. He was walking alone. He was by himself. There were times that he needed to be by himself. This was one of those times. We all have those times, haven't we? We'd like to need, we need to be by ourselves. He was by himself, the disciples weren't there, and she said, uh, walking alone in apparent meditation and prayer. Now, where was he? Well, he somehow, not directed, but somehow ended up to the pool of Bethesda. Now, the interesting part is that the location of that pool is really at the northeastern part of the, of, the, of the temple complex itself. And you have there now what is called St. Stephen's Gate. And that would have been the original gate, would have been the actual sheep's gate. You understand? That's where the sheep would come through that would actually be slaughtered because of the sacrifice. Now, it would have had a significance for him. Um, was that the gate through which they dragged him on that fateful Thursday night before the Friday they, when they were crucifying him, maybe? It was one of the three eastern gates. And I probably think it was that gate. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. So he's there. He's there. It's called the House of Mercy. And there's a lot of misery. That's a photograph. It's really that deep. Yeah, I was amazed myself when I saw it first where they were digging. Anyway, that's as deep as it is. And uh, this is sort of a picture believing that the angel would disturb the water. But these are really uh, underground uh, artesian wells that can, that can bring that about. What is significant is this. Jesus, Jesus came to the pool. I don't know what prompted him. He came to Bethesda. That's where he came. He was drawn to that maybe. He came there. So he comes to where the misery is. And he saw, he saw that man first. The paralytic didn't, remember last week we talked about the leopards. They saw him. And they were screaming out, have mercy on us. But not here. The man is lying there, occasionally looking perhaps at the water. He's just lying there, knowing he virtually has no chance. And then there is a person, the shadow falls over him, and he looks up, and he sees a face that is different from the others. I'll tell you what's the difference. I told you last week that if you were severely ill, 
that it was believed that you were under the punishment of God. Do you understand that? Remember the book of Job? That, that he was not a Jew. His friends were not Jews. But I'm saying, that was the belief. So people would look at him and saying, well, he must have deserved it. So he's an outcast, not just physically. He is an outcast socially and spiritually. You understand? So that's his... So when someone would look at him, we've all had those looks, when someone looks at you almost with a, an acquisition in their eyes, you can feel that, right? But this face is different. There was something about the demeanor of this stranger that was different. There was a warmth, a sympathy. He could feel the compassion. And then he said this. Do you want to be made well? And she says, for a brief moment, there sprung up hope in his mind, but then immediately it evaporated again. I, 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 I dwelt on these moments. Why is Jesus asking this? What do you think? Did this man want to be well? Obviously. That's what I thought you might say. But now here's an interesting part. And you were right in this case. So you don't worry about that. Have you ever met people? And I want to be honest here with you because this is becoming important later on. They're not well. They might have been a victim or victimized. Whatever, their affliction. But they're now in a comfort zone. I'm not saying they're not suffering. But they're now in a comfort zone and they don't want to leave that comfort zone. So that makes this question, do you want to be made whole, look quite reasonable. There are those who dwell on the dependence that uh, they have and the, the providence of the generosity, the sympathy of the people. There are people who always lap up the sympathy. Have you ever have known people like that? You want to help them, but you can't help them because they're not helping themselves. They want to stay, really stay where they are. You understand that? But as you said, in this case, yes, very good. <coughs> Do you want to be made well? Now, Jesus is healing someone when he was not even asked to do so. The man didn't ask it, did he? No, he didn't. Nobody called out to Jesus. It was a very busy place. Nobody called out by himself. The disciples weren't around pointing anybody anything out. No, no, he was by, it was between him and the man. Between him and... That's why I love this story. Because much of your life, much of your, of my life, is between me and him. Me and and him. Do you understand? So, so, the sick man answered, and this is an, an important answer. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. His hope is in a phenomenon that is not even reality. There are people hoping for a miracle that simply isn't there. He, his, he thinks, his mindset, his mindset says, I got to get into the pool as the first when the water is stirred up. That's what he believes. He has no idea who he is talking to and who is talking to him. 
He has no idea. No idea whatsoever. He believes his only way is to be put in that pool when the water is stirred up and he must be the first and that is what he believes. Ever dealt with people, when you try to help them, you just don't seem to be able to get their mindset on track of the reality that really is there. They stuck on this thought. That's it. You can understand that in this case. He says, but while I am coming, so he had some capacity of movements, another steps down before me, and they used to trample each other. That is true. That is true. So Jesus said to him, and this is the most amazing thing. You know the story. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, three things. Rise, rise. Take up your bed and walk. How reasonable is that? He had looked, I put to you, he had looked into the face of Jesus. I think the tonation, the manner in which Jesus spoke to him before, Jesus listened to him. He listened to his dilemma. And then he ordered him. He told him, rise, pick up that bed, and walk. Fascinating. Rise, three things. Three things he couldn't do. And look at the order. The first thing you've got to be able to do is to rise. Then if you can pick up your bed as well, well, you might be able to walk as well. There's an order of difficulty. And he's expecting him to do this. And immediately the man was made well. Now, this is the fascinating part of the story. How long did it take? Now, here is the question. Did he get up? Because he felt the strength in his body, his muscles and bones. Or did that come as he got up? What do you think? How many of you believe that he waited until the strength was there and then he got up? How many? No takers. That's good. I'm glad about that. If he would have thought, he doesn't know who's talking to him. He doesn't know that. If he would have thought, "Ah, that's a stupid thing to say. I can't do that. Yeah? He'd be still there. Well, no, he wouldn't be. Of course, yeah, he would have died there. Get it? But he got up. Something compelled him to get up. And to me, that is the most fascinating part of this story. He got up, and he didn't know who was saying it to him. Fantastic. Immediately. So he wanted to be made whole. He did, and he acted. He took up his bed, and he walked. That's exactly what he did do. Now, Jesus had given him no assurance of divine help. He didn't know who was speaking to him. Now, what Jesus didn't say is, is, give me your hand and let's see if I can help you up. None of the above. Because you see sometimes the pictures where, where Jesus sticks out his hand and he's sort of helping him up. No, he's not. He's not touching him. Get up. Get up. And uh, no assurance at all. He got up before he felt he was made whole. And yet he didn't know who said it. I like that man. I think it might have been his own fault, but by the same token. 
putting your will on the side of Christ is obviously the core message of this incident. For except he didn't know it was Jesus. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. If you don't believe his word, folks, if you don't believe his words, it will not be fulfilled. Get it? Right. Only those who want to be made whole will be made whole. That's true. There is no virtue in remaining a faltering, failing Christian. Now let's stop there for a moment. There are those that struggle, and that would be quite a number of us. And if you think that I don't struggle, we all do. Don't just think that I'm way ahead of you. We're traveling together. You understand that? Okay. So, don't you hate faltering and failing? You hate it, don't you? Why do we do that? And why, why there's no virtue in it? Because there is Jesus who says, get up, pick up that bed, and walk. He can do it. You can't. He can. The first thing Jesus told him to do was the thing that he could not do. There's no soft approach here. You understand? There is no soft approach. The first thing he asked him, rise! Well, he can't. Yes, he can. And he did. That's the first thing that he asked. He decided to do what Jesus told him to do, and he didn't even know it was Jesus. This is the remarkable thing of the story. Love this story. Love this story. The moment he was willing, this is a key message. The moment he was willing, he was able. Can you remember that? When Jesus tells you to do something, the moment you are willing, you are able. Now, please remember that. Please remember that. Why did Jesus say, rise, take up your bed? Why did he do that? Because there was no need for his bed to be in that place anymore. There is no room, there is no facility, there is no luxury of a relapse. You know how sometimes you take a decision, you're going to follow Jesus, but you leave things where they are just in case you default? Yeah? Let me put it in simple language. When you go home, you pour that alcohol down the drain. That's the first thing you do. You throw those facts in the bin where they belong. And that's just two little items. They're not as important as you getting on your knees and say, Lord, please help me to get this right, to be in harmony with you. That what you know is wrong, you get up, you rise, and you pick up the bed. You burn your bridges. Burn your bridges before that bridge burns you. You understand? That is faith. Without faith. Why did Jesus say, rise, take up your bed and walk? I tell you why he said that. There was no need for him to be there anymore. He's made whole. You got to leave where you think you are. You rise, you take up that bed, there is no way back, and you walk away, you walk away where you actually should have never been. Yeah? 
Bear it in mind. That's the message of Bethesda. If Jesus gives you the power to rise, he will give you the power to walk. He will. Definitely. Definitely. He removed the weakness, whatever the ailment was. I love Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, even if it takes 38 years or longer. It's all right. As long as he finishes it, you're home. It's okay. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because faith is a gift, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Can you imagine, can you imagine, can you imagine God looking beyond the incarnation, that in itself, looking beyond rejection, brutality, physical abuse, the most cruel treatment, the most degrading treatment, hanging on the cross stark naked, not being able to look after your bodily, it's a shocking thing. He knew that as God. There's a separation that they didn't know, but it had to find place, part of it. Also, he can have the joy, have the joy of seeing you one day in heaven. Guys, You've got to understand this. This is truth. One day, when you walk through those gates by the grace of God, you want to remember what it costs, what he had to do for it. It's a lot. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and there was plenty of it, he sat down at the right hand of God of the throne of God. Remember Jesus saying, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth, just before he left. He can do it. When he says rise, you rise, because he gives you the power. When he says walk, you walk, because he gives you the power. And when he says pick that up, you pick that up. Obey him. Obey him. Alone. The man felt alone and friendless. No one there to help him. Many people feel alone and friendless, and Jesus knows all about that because they all ran away. So he knows. The sufferer of Bethesda was paralyzed. We don't know what his disease was. He was paralyzed. But I'm going to put it to you, so is every sinner. Sin paralyzes you. It eats your time and your energies that should be put to use in a very different way. And time doesn't come back. You can't retrace your steps. It's always worse than it seems, like an iceberg. It's ingrained. You only see 10%. The rest of the 90% is locked into that body of yours and your mind. Hard to get rid of. In fact, it is really, it's really being chained, isn't it? It is really being chained. You are a prisoner. You thought you could handle it. No, it's handling you. That's the problem. That's the problem. Feeling that he was shut out from God's mercy. There is nothing worse than feeling that God wants nothing to do with you. But I can tell you now, it is the devil's lie. When you feel that God may nothing have nothing to do with you, I can assure you that is not true. He is waiting for you. Because what he said to the man in Bethesda, he is saying to you, do you want to be made whole? Now, now, when he puts that to you today, when he puts that to you, it, it, it means giving up this, it may, give up the, it may bring about changes in your life. You have to be willing to do that. If you're not willing to rise, stay where you are. Yeah? Stay where you are. But don't wince, don't complain. 
because it's your choice. But when he says, rise, you should rise. The sufferer had passed long years of misery. He never knew about a God that, yes, he hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. It took me years to learn that, that God hates sin. I, I understood that. But it, that he loves the sinner. That's the part I couldn't get my mind around. But then Calvary says he does, doesn't it? So there you are. Sin, when you sin, feels like a lifetime and you're really, really down and out. Go to this story. I love this. I think the man, the artist, his name is Harry Anderson. Would that be right? Anybody remember Harry Anderson? He was a, an artist that did a lot of illustrations for our church. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He has it right. Jesus doesn't touch him, and Jesus is alone. It's him and Jesus. That's it. His only hope, a miracle. But your and my hope is a miracle too. When Jesus works in us, enables us, as we respond, we are part of a miracle. You have to be willing not just believe, you have to be willing to be part of a miracle. You understand? Because it is a miracle, an absolute miracle. We can no more live a holy life than a paralytic would be able, had the capacity of walking. He couldn't do it, and so there it is. I like this one. The tear of the sinner is more beloved to God than the arrogance of the righteous man or woman. It's true. God is very sensitive to that. What went through the mind of Jesus when he saw him? You know, he wanted to use his powers to cure everybody, but he wouldn't do it. He couldn't do it because it actually was a Sabbath, and he knew that would upset the apple cart no end and cut short his ministry. But he couldn't resist. He couldn't resist this man couldn't resist. His compassion compelled him. Jesus can break those chains and he will break those chains if you let him. Now, back to the story. That day was the Sabbath. Now, you can imagine, he's walking, you know, like he's never walked before. He's carrying this bed. Now, when we talk about the bed, it's not a posturepedic mattress that you get from, from David Jones. You understand? This is a, a, a thing that you roll up, put under your arms. That's a bed, by the way. You understand that? So he's walking, and it's Sabbath, and he doesn't even remember the Sabbath, and he's very happy. He is praising God. She said he was praising God and wonderful. So the Jews there, who might remember who this was, uh, the, the priest and the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. Oh. Uh, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. That's the little rolled up over here. Yeah? It's not lawful to do that. You see, they had a law. They made a law, a bylaw, if you like, human instrumentation, said that you cannot carry a bed unless there's someone on it for the need of transportation. On the Sabbath, you couldn't carry the bed itself. That was a problem. So, now, I love the answer here. <laughs> he mouses back to them. He said, he said to them, he who made me well, he said to me, take up your bed and walk. That's exactly what I'm doing. Wouldn't you? He's, he's happy, he's happy. They're so cold. They're not happy for him. Why couldn't, why couldn't they say, hey, listen, it's nice. I'll be very happy for you that you're feeling better. Well, feeling better is an understatement. But, but you understand. No, there's no compassion. There's nothing. They've got no compassion. They've got nothing like that. They couldn't even spell the word, I'm sure. <laughs> then they said to him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, I have a question for you. It's a very easy one to answer. How many people do you think are in Jerusalem at that time 
that could say to one that for 38 years had not been able to do it, get up, take that bed and walk. How many, how many, how many? There's only one. They knew exactly who it was. But they wanted the evidence against Jesus because he had healed on the Sabbath. I want to, I want to point something out to you here. So, Jesus had committed two offenses. He had healed on the Sabbath. Now, were you allowed to, to attend to incidents or, or problems on the Sabbath? Yes, but they had to be of an acute nature. If it was something that was uh, long-term, uh, chronic, you could leave it till the next day. You understand what I'm saying? So if you cured somebody that was chronically ill on the Sabbath, you were breaking the Sabbath. Get it? Not God's law, man-made law. So that was the first. The other one that he did, he told him to carry, he instructed him to carry his bed, which was also unlawful. So Jesus was a double Sabbath breaker. Well, what Jesus didn't do on purpose is to heal everybody in those five porticos because it was a Sabbath. Oh, that would have upset things. It would have cut short his ministry. Um, I often wondered about that. Um, if I was Jesus, and I'm not <laughs> by any means, I, I could be tempted in being purposeful. On, but then he wasn't looking for an argument, really. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but there it is. It's interesting. But the one who was healed didn't know who it was. He still didn't know it was Jesus who healed him. Fancy being made whole, and you don't know who did it. Well, it had to come from God. Now, he is a Jew. Jesus had withdrawn. Do you know that when Jesus said, rise, and he did rise, they pick up that bed, and he bent over, and he picked up that bed, and he was looking for his benefactor who had disappeared in the crowd because there were many people there. He'd lost sight of Jesus. He couldn't even thank him. He couldn't even thank him. It's interesting. So, so he didn't even know. So afterwards, Jesus finds him in the temple. Why does he find him in the temple? This man was under obligation, as any Jew would be. If you were healed, you had to go to the temple to give a thanksgiving offering, and he was doing that. That's a Levitical principle. You praise God for the healing. I hope you do too. Please praise God for his blessings. Don't forget it. Don't explain it away. If it was asked for, please thank God, and even if it wasn't asked for. Now, Jesus had attended to his physical need. Now he is attending to his spiritual need. He needs to know who healed him. Just as you and I need to know who has cared for us all these years. We need to know. And so he said to him, See that you have been made well, sin no more. Now, he told him to rise. It was an impossibility made possible. He told him to pick up his bed, which was an impossibility that he made possible. He told him to walk because it was impossible, but he made it possible. When Jesus says sin no more, he'll make that possible too. If you let him. If you respond. So there you are. We don't have to sin. Lest a worse thing come upon you. That's good solid counsel that he receives. So there we are. You know, he had received physical healing as well as spiritual healing. He was a complete new man. So, what does he do? No confession was made. No mercy was asked for. It was the gift from heaven itself, but he was in the house of mercy. He was at the right place because Jesus came. 
Jesus found him. I, I hear people say, I found Jesus. No, no, he found you. He found you. The man departed, and this is the irony of this little story here. The man departed, and what does he do? He told the Jews what they wanted to hear. That Jesus healed him, that Jesus healed him, and told him to pick up his bed and, and carry it. And they held it against Jesus, and of course he had to appear before the Sanhedrin, which is no problem. But I'm just saying, the man didn't know the animosity that the Jews held against Jesus. Now, by this time, he knows who Jesus is. It's interesting that we're in the pool, near the pool of Bethesda, that Jesus doesn't walk up to him and say, maybe I can help you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jesus, and by the way, I am the Messiah. I don't know how you would put it. It's interesting. Jesus never did that. He never did that. But by this time, this man knows who healed him. He certainly knows who healed him. It was Jesus. And he believed on him, who had him made well. Magnificent. So to the hopeless, the helpless today, you must never forget that tremendous blood was shed for you. You can never say, it wasn't for me. Yes, it was for you. No exception. No exception. And uh, whatever your problem, still Jesus wants to meet with you in the house of mercy. And he'll extend it to you. So there's no excuse for staying where you are. You understand? No excuse at all. He'll break the chains that you can't break. He'll do that. He will do that. He will absolutely, absolutely do that. No condemnation in Christ. Absolutely no condemnation in Christ. It's a wonderful thing to know that you have no condemnation. But you've got to answer this question. Every one of you here has to answer this question. Do you really want to be made well? Well, in that case, you'll have to respond. You rise, you pick up that bed, and you walk away. God bless you. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son 
Tim and Charlotte and Brian, that was magnificent. Remain standing as we bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, you're a wonderful God. And as we have this very moment and we've gone into your word and we hear the song and we hear the message in the song, we love you and we want to return this love, but please, please enable us to do so. We're so hopelessly in Help us to rise about everything, every desire, any lust, anything that it is in our way that is between you and us. Lord, you can do it. We can rise. We can take up that bed. And we can walk. Walk away from anything that you want us to walk away from. Because you are God. Thank you for being here today. Please stay with us. We have the fellowship and partake of the food that it may nourish our bodies. And Lord, as we go into the week, let the sweetness of this hour may be our inspiration to walk right, to do what you want us to do, and to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. God bless you.